Hey, I'm Paul Christie. And I'm Jennifer Forrester. And we're the pastors of First United Methodist Church in Hickory, Hickory North, North Carolina. Carolina. So, Jennifer, this is episode two of season 582 it or is four. season four. Yes. So, um, during this season, and, and I like that. I like the word. Do you like the word season? I like the word season, but I actually like the title of the season better. Pulpit POV. We're kind of hip. Pulpit POV. You know what POV stands for? Paul on Vogue. No. What? Point of view. Point of view. Okay. Pulpit point of view. Okay. Pulpit point of view. So yeah, this season we're talking about that and we're we're kind of talking through uh, the sermons that we just preached in. And, and you preached here this past Sunday. I preached in Highlands, North Carolina. That is Are right. you going to ask me about my sermon in Highlands? I can if you would like. No, that's okay. How about I just ask you about your sermon? All right. I'm ready. Ask away. So Jennifer, you preached uh, some familiar scripture from the Gospel of Mark. You know, it's in all the synoptic Gospels. That's a big word. What does synoptic mean, Paul? Um, it just means the three, the, the original three. And John, so that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic Correct. Gospels. Correct. And what does the word synoptic mean? I mean... I know what it means to me. What does it mean to you, Jennifer? <laughs> okay, so it begins with, with the sound sin, meaning the same. And so synoptic would say that those three Gospels are essentially the same. Very right? similar. They yes. tell similar stories, just in different ways. Yeah, so Mark was the first Gospel written, and so Matthew and Luke kind of looked at Mark as they did that. But that's why Mark's, I, I love the Gospel of Mark, because Mark tells the story. And that's it. Reader's Digest version. Doesn't embellish it at all yep, where Matthew and Luke do that. Well, they had different audiences <clears throat> too. So yes. Mark is written for Mark's audience. And so the scripture on Sunday was Mark 10. It's um, the the scripture of the rich man. Yes. Um, which can sometimes step on our toes a bit, right? Like sometimes it's tough scripture. Um, I did tell the congregation um, on Sunday after the 11 o'clock service, I think, as they were walking out, that lately I have had these tough scriptures, and they said that they feel like you've had the easy ones. Um, no, they, they didn't say that. They actually did say they that. They did not say that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, well, you know, uh, you you fixed the preaching schedule. That's your fault. I don't fix the you preaching know. schedule. Okay, so let's get to our scripture. So the rich man, um, this scripture... Um, has Jesus interrupted as Jesus is often interrupted? Um, and in this particular pericope, that's a big word too, isn't it? This particular pericope. That means story. Yes, yeah, story. Um, it is a rich man that interrupts Jesus, and he seems to be concerned of um, his salvation. He's curious about eternal life and what he must do to inherit that. And so he interrupts Jesus. And, and the interesting thing to me in this scripture is, for me, it almost feels as if he already knows the answer, right? Like he's wanting to talk about how good he is um, because he's very quick to answer Jesus when Jesus says, you know, well, you know the commandments. You know, you can't murder, um, no adultery, you can't steal, he goes through the commandments and, you know, I can almost see the, the man like boasting like, oh, yeah, check, check, check. I did that. I'm right in line to inherit, you know, eternal life. But, and so you get to the but of the scripture, which is, um, but let's talk about your possessions. Sell everything and then come and follow me. And those are tough words for us. I think especially in the American culture. Right. Um, to sell everything and follow Jesus. Mm. What do you think about that, Paul? Well, um, Jennifer, since you preach this text, and I am to be the one asking the questions, uh, I want to I begin by uh, saying uh, I loved, I, I listened to your sermon a couple of times. I saw it at the Vine, and then I saw it at 11. Um, How did you manage that since you were in Highlands? We have a thing called the World Wide Web. Ooh, and where would you find that sermon on the World Wide Web? I found it on the Facebook. On the church Facebook? The church All right. Facebook All well, there you page. go. If you have not 
worshiped with us online, um, please do so. First United Methodist Church Hickory on Facebook. Dot org. First UMC Hickory dot org. Right, but I was talking about the Facebook account, which you wouldn't put dot org. I would. I wouldn't Google it. Okay, well, that probably wouldn't okay, get you so, um, Anyhow, so yeah, I love the way you kind of got into this scripture because you you talked about you listen to musicals. I did not know that about you. So, um, And um, that was stemming from a play that you had seen in London. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. And, and, and the musical that, that you uh, quoted the song from was a musical called Wicked. Yes, that's not the musical that I saw in London, um, but it is the musical that popped up on my YouTube account when I was listening to the songs from Hades Town. So, beginning a sermon that way, do you think you grabbed people's attention by, by mentioning a song that some of those folks would have known? Well, I mean, you always take the risk in telling any story or trying to connect scripture to your life in any way. But I do think by sharing our experiences that it might capture some people. Now, it's not always going to capture all people, but if we can capture people at the beginning of a sermon, I do feel like they're able to then engage at some level and hopefully be curious enough to continue to listen. Um, I... Like I said, you never really know if a story is going to capture somebody. But I did get a text message later that day saying that they loved that song and they had been singing that song um, ever since and they loved that musical. And um, yeah. So, and part of the reason you did that was because of the, the question that Jesus threw back at the rich young ruler. I mean, it's the rich man here, one. Matthew or Luke says he was a ruler. Another one says he was young. Right. So we all tend to put all this together. But um, where where the, the rich man comes to Jesus and says, good teacher. And Jesus says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Yep. So I, I love that you, you kind of had that good running through the theme of your sermon. Um and, and I love that because you, you Googled good. I Googled good. It's a very, very diverse word. Um, in our culture, the word good is about as diverse as the word love. You know, I can, sure. I can love the hamburger I had yesterday or I can love God. And those are right. two very different types of love. And good is a very similar word. It has a lot of usages. Um, and so, yeah, define good. What is good, Paul? Um, thank you. You're saying I'm good? No, I said what is good. What is good? Duke basketball. Okay. Uh, so, uh, the so, United Methodist Church. All right. Um, French fries and hamburgers. Okay, from where? Mm, five guys. I like five okay. guys. Okay. All right, so five guys is good. Um, and let's see, um, puppy dogs and rainbows. Okay, so my the things that I would list, my top four good things would be like my family is good oh yeah i meant Mm -hmm. that was number one yeah no you didn't name that you said duke basketball um i think we have a good church staff yep that's what i said is number two i think it's good that we are in ministry i said that is number three um and i am feeling good today so those would be my definitions of good or the things that i would list as good so, Not Duke basketball, puppy dogs and rainbows, five guys, or... Your family. No. What was the That's second one you said? Uh, no, no, no. I've, uh, we're, let's, let's switch this around now. Okay. Anyway, so to define good, only God is good, Jesus responds to the man. And that, it, it is at that point that I realized what Jesus says next to this man is really asking him about the first three commandments that he didn't name specifically. He starts talking to the man about his possessions and how he worries so much about his wealth. And that then speaks to the first three commandments that Jesus didn't name by saying, where is your heart? Right. Where right. is your heart? So where- Because only God is good, if that's not where your heart is, all of these other things kind of are irrelevant. Because Jesus says it other ways in in the scripture too, like uh, where 
your heart is, there your treasure will be. Yes. Where your treasure is, there will be your heart. Yes. Um, and so I, I think that was a, a good way to, to kind of get into this scripture. And, and, and I love the way, because you talked about the, the many good things that we're doing as a church and as a people, and particularly with the disaster, how everybody ran toward the mountains and we still want to go and help people. Oh, I had and that is so many, good. Yeah, so many messages yesterday. I've taken a phone call today. Like people want to do good. Right. They want to help. And and why do you think we want to do good? What's within our human nature? Because you talked about that a little bit in your sermon. You gave a, a quote from Kate Bowler uh, as well. Uh, I did not I thought, quote Kate Bowler, but uh, I no, appreciate you thinking that not I Kate did. Bowler. I do like Kate Bowler, and What's I quote the her one? some. But um, not Kate Bowler. So did you Nadia listen? Bowles. Oh, Nadia you did listen Bowles to my Weber. sermon. Yeah. You know, Good Kate, Kate Bowler and Coach K had a podcast last night. Oh, they, I like to listen did. to that. Yeah. yeah, I like Kate Bowler. Um, but Nadia Bowles Weber. I did so, like Nadia Bowles. So tell me that quote. Do you remember that quote and and what why why that was relevant for this sermon? Well, so Kate, so Nadia Bowles Weber. See, you about messed me up. Nadia Bowles Weber did an NPR um, recording radio show several years ago um, after she had written one of her books, and the interviewer asked her the question, you know, what do you do to get closer to God? And and if you've ever listened to Nadia Bowles Weber, she's pretty direct, and and she answers questions quickly and very thoughtfully. But she's pretty direct, and so she jumped back like, what? Why in the world would I want to do that? And she said, I am not that good. Hmm. And and she really kind of named the place that I think most of us live where we do have this innate desire to do good and to be good, but we are confronted with things that we kind of like draw the line, right? Um, you know, in her quote, she says, if I am trying to get closer to God, if I'm trying to be good, that's going to require that I love somebody that I don't want to love. Right. It's going to require that I maybe, you know, get smelly by hugging somebody that maybe doesn't smell that good. Right. Um, it's maybe going to require me to see some inconsistency about myself that needs to change that I'm not willing to change. Um, and so she names those challenges for us as children of God, as humans, where we do fall short. And none of us really like to be challenged, right? We don't want to love that person we don't want to love. We don't want to change that thing about ourselves that separates us from God, whether it's possessions, whether it's, you know, uh, an addiction, whether it's a habit, maybe it's our tongue even, you know, we hear a lot about... Um, the words we say in Scripture, um, whatever it is that we need to change about ourselves that's kind of standing in our way to be in relationship with God. And I think what the Scripture is calling us to and reminding us of, as Jesus was reminding the rich man, is the commandments can be summed up in this way, which is about two chapters later, but it's this way. Love, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and spirit, and love your neighbor as yourself but we have to first be in that right relationship with God. And I think often we make this about the material thing, the riches. Go sell everything you have, and then you can follow me. It doesn't mean that if you live in this world and you, for whatever reason, have acquired many possessions, many houses, cars, bank accounts, whatever it is, I don't believe that it's a judgment on having possessions, but rather a judgment on caring more about your possessions than you do about your relationship to God and others. Right. So um, thank you, Jennifer, because that, that I hope that, that we uh, have a better understanding of why you, you did the things you did. I thought it was a very good sermon. I think you hooked people in at the first and I love the Nadia Bowles Weber quote, um, but you also drew in how we try to do good now, but if only God is good. And at 11 o'clock, you talked about a trip to Haiti where mm -hmm. uh, we've been on many missions there. 
Um, and so, Jennifer, just as we close here, in one sentence, I always, in preaching, I try to get folks to, if you have one sentence that you wanted to make sure you said on Sunday or that that summed up that sermon, what would your one sentence be uh, for the rich young ruler or the rich man? Um, I think that sentence would be more of a question, perhaps. Okay. Um, if, if I'm standing with the rich young ruler, it would be more of a question. And it, the question would be, is how am I allowing Christ to work in my life to change my life for good? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And, and again, uh, very well done. And uh, thank you for um, giving uh, Paul on Vogue art, the pulpit point of view. I, I get I get messed up with these anacronyms, um, but thank you. I thought it was in all seriousness. Did you say an acronym? An acronym. Oh, okay. An acronym. Okay. Um, so thank you so much for well, sharing with us. Well, thank you, um, Paul, and thank you for listening to um, worship, even though you were worshiping somewhere else. And I know that you blessed their lives there, too. Um, in Highlands. Well, thank you. And my name's Paul Christie. And I'm Jennifer Forrester. And we're the pastors of First United Methodist Church in Hickory, Hickory North, North Carolina. Carolina.